Hello and welcome back to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. This is a podcast created to enhance, connect, and inspire the Yarra Valley Grammar community and beyond. So wherever you're listening from today, I want to thank you for tuning in, for being part of this community. My name's Paul Joy, and I'm delighted to present with to you another conversation with a Yog, a Yarra Old Grammarian. And today, I welcome our first repeat guest, Cameron Britt from the class of 2002. Cameron first appeared on the Inspired by Yarra podcast at episode 28, but I must confess that we had some tremendous audio challenges in that episode. It's actually quite a challenge to listen to. And uh, as we kick off this conversation, Cameron is coming to us from uh, Perth over in Western Australia, working now at the South Fremantle Footy Club. And uh, we're going to unpack a little of the journey of time here at Yarra and how that has led to an experience of being uh, the CEO of the South Fremantle Footy Club right now and some of the challenges, the hurdles, the twists and the turns along the way. I'm going to begin by asking him where he is right now and how he got to be there. Enjoy this conversation with Cameron Britt from the class of 2002. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Inspired by Yarra, where we have the opportunity to sit down with a Yarra old grammarian, a yog, and we talk a little bit about times gone by, their experiences at school, the adventures since leaving school, and this is our first interview with somebody second time round, and I'm delighted to be able to chat with Cameron Britt from the class of 2002. Cameron, thanks for joining us this morning. And then tell us where you are situated at the moment. Thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, appreciate the opportunity to, to come back again and, and have a further conversation with the, the team at Yarra. Uh, right now, I'm situated in my office uh, at South Fremantle Football Club, which is based at Fremantle Oval. So all the way in o- over in WA um, for those uh, familiar or unfamiliar with, with Western Australia, Fremantle is is like a satellite uh, city uh, just south of Perth, being obviously the capital city of WA. So find myself here uh, two hours earlier than the time in Melbourne, but yeah, really looking forward to having this conversation. Terrific. So we're recording this in the midst of uh, some interesting times, some historical times really around uh, particularly COVID-19 and, and the impact of that in our connection with people and the proximity that we can have, some of the, the work that we can do, the sports that we can play. And now you, you mentioned South Fremantle Footy Club. Are you playing footy at the moment? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not playing football at the moment. I, I signed off on my uh, actual football playing uh, some years ago. Uh, but what I am doing is is leading this organisation and, and effectively being custodian of this football club and, and a lot of people who are playing football. Um, in November last year, I was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the South Fremantle Football Club. Um, and uh, yeah, with a, with a pretty um, high profile and, and milestone year ahead for our club, being our 120th year in, in 2020 since our establishment in in the year 1900. Um, and, and with that came a whole range and host of uh, events and activities and commemoration type um, undertakings, which uh, frankly pretty much all been wiped out by uh, COVID-19. Uh, like, like most of us globally, uh, things changed very quickly and very dramatically. However, um, we're, we're starting to work our way back through some recovery uh, planning and, and like many now, starting to consider what it looks like for us to switch back on. Yeah, for sure. And how long have you been in that role as leader of, of that organisation? As you say, in such a critical year for the whole organisation, how long have you been there? Now, I commenced uh, in, in November 2019, so so relatively short period of time, although it, it feels like a lifetime almost given what we've all been dealing with. Um, but yeah, commenced in November, did a, did a whole host of planning. I came, came into the business um, uh, about a month after we we played in the grand final and being beaten here in the in the waffle, which is the West Australian Football League, we lost to a, a pretty powerhouse team called Subiaco Football Club. Uh, so I came in uh, as the the newly appointed CEO and 
as I said, we had a range of uh, range of activities and, and undertakings um, in uh, in plan and in vogue, um, but things quickly changed. So really, uh, really, I my my you know I pivoted like like many businesses and leaders, and we switched towards what we needed to do as a football club to make sure we could survive. A, um, clearly a, a health pandemic, but but probably the the full effect I think seen in the Australian commercial landscape was clearly the financial impact um, of COVID nineteen and and um, some some previously um, confirmed and and long held revenues just um, being obliterated before our eyes and and having to be quite innovative and and adaptive to this new landscape uh, for how we can run the business and, and shelter and protect the business from exposure. Um, to ensure that we're here for a few more years than uh, just the 120. Absolutely. And as you say, relatively new into such a critical leadership position and obviously nobody saw this coming. So what did you do as a leader? What do you think your new organisation, you were new to them, they were new to you, what were they looking for in you and how did you deliver it? Yeah, I think... um I think I, I uh, well, the reason um, the reason I was appointed and probably proof in the pudding that I was successful, which is which is fantastic for me, um, very obvious statement, um, was the fact that um, the the waffle competition in Western Australia probably had uh, seen some some diminishing crowds, some some diminishing uh, commercial revenue flowing through the game. Um, it, its brand was becoming, say, a little bit tired. So I, I probably brought a a, um, a track record and some previous success in another West Australian sporting business where I was CEO for four years, which was actually a basketball club. Uh, and that was when I last spoke to you, Paul, and and the team at the um, Inspired by Era podcast. Um, very much a, a fan-focused approach and, and how we could effectively use um, our brand, which in Western Australia, the South Fremantle Football Club is an iconic sporting institution. It's a reasonably blue-chip brand. I mean, everyone's familiar with, clearly, the West Coast Eagles and the Fremantle Dockers, um, the two AFL clubs here. But at a, at a waffle football level and, and that competition, South Fremantle um, has been a, a very high-profile football club and, and remains to this day... Um, I'll, I'll slightly digress that two of our um, recent alumni, um, Marlon Pickett, uh, who debuted for Richmond in the AFL Grand Final, and uh, Tim Kelly as well, who spent time at Geelong and then was just picked up on a on a uh, landmark contract with with West Coast Eagles here locally. They were both plucked out of our our South Fremantle League team in the last couple of years. So we, uh, we you know, we're developing um, some very high quality and competent footballers. So there was a range of, um, I guess there was a range of aspects of the football club that, that I wanted to really get my hands on and, and start to drive and, and turn around. And, and we've got such a, uh, I've mentioned already several times the 120 years history, but we've got such a, such a rich and strong legacy here and um, players like Morris Rioli before making his name uh, in, in the VFL um, came down from the TV Islands and played a lot of football with some of his brothers and cousins and 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 others from um, from that that you know really fertile ground football fertile ground of the TV Islands in the Northern Territory. They all came through the South Fremantle Football Club, so we've got a really strong legacy which we want to ensure that we you know preserve and um, and celebrate. But um, the the modern demands of a football club and and the modern I guess commercial requirements meant that yeah, we really needed to make some adjustments and we're still still making those, but um, a few things have been paused, but let's hope not deleted. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's acknowledge that things are on pause at the moment, but I want to actually hit rewind and take you back to your sporting days at school because I assume that your interest and passion for sport now and, and you have built a career being around sporting clubs and being involved with the, the blood, sweat and tears and the passion and the coaching and the challenge of sport. But it, I guess it may have begun a long time ago when you were maybe running around the turf or the footy fields or the basketball courts here at Yarra Valley Grammar. Where would you have preferred to be? Which sporting pursuit was uh, – what was your game? Yeah, look um – Certainly, I think you know where I find myself right now, leading a leading a football club. Uh, 
is is no coincidence. I've I've always been really passionate about Australian rules football. That was probably my my go to sport um, growing up, and and particularly through through the time at Yarra um, and into the Yarra old boys, um, uh, old, old grammarians as they've uh, as they're now branded. Um, so there's been you know football's been a really focal point of, of my life, be it playing or, or spectating. I'm a I'm a long suffering died in the wool Melbourne, uh, Melbourne Football Club supporter. So you know certainly the highs and lows of football are not lost on me, and there's certainly been <laughs> plenty of lows uh, in that equation. But um, the the beauty of Yarra uh, really for me, and, and again I, I arrived in in '98, so that was actually year eight. I did year seven. Uh, at a different school was just um, just the smorgasbord of really um, of opportunities and and not just sporting um, you know if you love the violin there was plenty of music options if you love being on the stage and that was your thing then you know the, the drama options were were, um, were were considerable but for me being a, I guess a bit of a bit of a jock and and loving sport um, then yeah I, I just walked in and I just thought this was the the best place on earth, heaven on earth, effectively, um, just a wide range of opportunities. And I think at one time, probably around year 11, I was playing first footy, first basketball. Uh, I was in the snow sports team. I was in the athletics team and I was also in the debating team. And, you know, I look back now and think, I don't know how I did all that um, and passed uh, my schooling. But, uh, yeah, that was just what was um, – what was encouraged, just have a go at everything and um, and see what you like. And, and that was just, a, I guess, a wonderful part of the, the Yarra culture and, I guess, the ethos that your only limitation, I guess, was was your own, um, your own uh, you know, confidence to try something or your own enthusiasm to, to give something a go and stick with it. Yeah. And look, I, I think you'd be pleased and proud to hear that that is still – the message. There are still many opportunities for students to have a go and you don't have to be the best. We just encourage you to have a go. And by having a go at lots of things, you might find something that uh, you're either excelling, you're good at, or you really enjoy. And, and that's perhaps something that you should pursue. Uh, and, and clearly something that you found as well with the, the range of things that were available and you found a sweet spot and were able to pursue that. And, and now, obviously, still involved in sport, which is something that you love. But I still I want to press a little bit further and see whether you can recall a particular match, a particular, was there a kick after the siren? Was there a particular training night that sticks in your memory? Was there somewhere that, that you saved the game somehow? Take us back to a moment where you stood tall and you were one of your proudest sporting moments. Sure. Yeah, look, um, I do recall a time, I think it was out at um, Penley and Essendon Grammar School, and this was, I think, year 10. So I might have been playing year 10A basketball before uh, getting into the first basketball squad in in year 11 and 12. Um, We were out there, and and I remember I had... um, I'd had my heart set on this pair of Jordan, um, Air Jordan basketball boots and quite topical comment really given uh, the world was recently captivated by the the Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls, um, you know, sports docuseries. But yeah, I'd, I'd had my heart set on these pair of Jordans and 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 mum, mum had been uh, reluctant to invest in this, I'm sure, a very expensive pair of shoes, although you never look at the price or understand at that age, you just want them. Um, so anyway, I, I think I'd, I'd sort of worn her down over about 12 months and I'd ended up getting this pair of Air Jordans and and um, and I just had to have them. And I, I recall um, they actually, when I tried them on at the, at the store, um, they didn't quite fit, but it was the only size they had. So I remember um, effectively lying to mum saying, oh, they're a perfect fit. Oh, you know, walk around again, just make sure and... And, you know, the, the, the young teenager is probably doing the thing with the thumb to check my toe position. I'm trying to push my foot forward so there's there's less gap. And so I've won one over them too. Um, and anyway, I've ended up with these Jordans, but I just felt so guilty and, and almost ashamed that I'd been training in these shoes and was incredibly uncomfortable, probably like clown shoes, really. Like I just couldn't get up and down the court. But anyway, uh, I thought I've got to stick with this and the feet will grow or let's hope. So um, I've been, I've been dealing with the... The, the you know shoe gate um, but anyway we played this 10A's game and we'd come down to a final possession in basketball and I'd been fouled 
um, going to the ring. Um, and uh, it was just that, I guess, that quintessential moment where there was two foul shots to uh, left in the game. The, the buzzer had gone in basketball, and, and I think it was one foul shot to draw the, um, to to draw or yeah to level the score, and and another would actually win the game. And and uh, I was I was able to hit both, um, and you know, great celebrations. And parents were all really happy, and my teammates were happy. But I just remember thinking that is this the moment when the the shoes actually justified themselves? Um, because yeah, there'd been a fair bit of discomfort. But as as it turned out, you know, my feet did grow, and, and things got a bit more comfortable from there on. But I just still remember that moment, um, and it was just it was just a great moment because it's I guess it's every young person's dream to yeah kick a goal after the siren or hit the foul shots after the buzzer to win the game and probably um probably wasn't a you know a significant consequence it, it might have just been a game in the home and away season and it certainly wasn't finals or to win a year 10 series or championship whatever it was back then but yeah just just one i, I clearly still remember so it meant something but it, it was certainly um and intricately linked to to the stuff that was happening with my shoes at the time I love that storytelling and and the truth of uh, just being so desperate to make those shoes. You just willed them to fit. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that you were able to sink those shots. And it's interesting, though, I just want to observe that even though lots of young people play sport, and even at professional level, I don't know that everybody wants to have that pressure of having the kick after the siren or having the opportunity to to to, sh- to shoot those foul shots after the buzzer goes. But there was something in you that stood up, that stepped into that uh, situation, into the, that gave you the confidence perhaps to, to give it a good go. And, you know, of course we love the story that says it worked and you had success. Were there times where you put your hand up to say, yeah, pick me, I'll have a go, but... It actually didn't work, whether it's on the sporting field or maybe you played the wrong note or maybe, you you know, the words didn't come out quite right. You were at an interview or you were addressing a, a, a group of work colleagues. Can you tell us about a time where it, it didn't go so well? Yeah, sure. Look, I think um, I think there's probably probably plenty of examples if I, if I think back because, um, yeah, hitting hitting the two foul shots and, and being the, the hero for a week or so in the locker room, I mean, they're not everyday occurrences, of course, and, and um, you know, life has a lot of hard knocks. Um, to, to probably try and hone in on, on one, I, I think um, I perhaps think back to, uh, yeah, arriving in, in year eight um, and only being a year uh at Yarra Valley and then um, being quite fortunate to um, be elected by my peers, which I won't forget in a hurry to be middle school captain in year nine. Um, that was that was a major achievement, but I, I remember some, some real and, and would have had no idea of what this, um, I guess what this, this theory or psychology was back then, but I've probably come to know it's this imposter syndrome now of, being elected to this this really important um, position as middle school captain within the school, and 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 you know seemingly after a fleeting, um, you know just one year of uh, of being at Yarra and, and getting to know people um, arriving from a from a different school, but uh, I think so. There was that piece um, feeling a little bit unsure and uncomfortable in my skin, although knowing it was a great honour and and anything peer voted, of course, is 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 um, particularly. Um, particularly um you know rewarding and satisfying but um and i'm not sure how it still works paul but um that the middle school captains similar to the to the school captains of year 12 actually did a a lot of public speaking so we'd get up at middle school assemblies and we'd be part of the the official party i think it was called and um yeah we had had quite a workload really which probably um you look back and think well it was it was shaping and molding us for things to come but um, yeah, I, I recall particularly early on uh, having to make some speeches or or read uh, some readings and um, standing at the lectern in front of say the middle school in the um, in the performing arts center. And fortunately, the lectern was there and quite wide because my knees were literally knocking. I could feel my knees knocking together as I stood there, but I, I'd managed to get the words out, and, and then that probably helped shape some confidence and ability into then the, the debating scene and um, 
yeah, there's, there's other than uh, at home, there's not too many arguments I think I lose anymore. So, and that's probably all helpful, but, um, but yeah, particularly, um, public speaking early on was, was a really nervy time. And, and I don't think I'd be alone in, in saying that it is for everyone, but again, through, you know, repetition and, and honing some craft and, um, building a bit of resilience and, and just, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, people give you a go if you if you make an effort and a, and a fair attempt, and and now I'm, um, I think I'm I'm quite confident. Obviously, uh, I'm about twenty years older now, of course, but uh, quite confident speaking in front of a, a room full of people, or or in front of ten thousand people if I had to, and and that was definitely some some skills and confidence built through Yarra because I was forced uh, into that situation. Absolutely, and and look, to be honest, you're not the first person to have recalled a story very similar to that. Uh, what happens behind that lectern and the, the knees knocking is, uh, is not an uncommon experience. And actually, I'm really pleased that that is an experience that you can remember and that lots of kids get to have because, as you've said, the opportunity to be there and feel that fear but have that responsibility does set you up really well for opportunities as they are presented in the future. And it may not be speaking to a group of your peers uh, in terms of a group of students, but as you do now, you know, you, you might have the opportunity to speak to a, a boardroom or to a group of potential investors or a group of, you know, work colleagues or whatever leadership role you might be. Um, that opportunity to speak and contribute and uh, communicate is so vital. So uh, I'm glad that you were knocking those knees and I'm glad you pulled through. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's definitely a skill. <laughs> For sure. Tell me, um, what happened after you left Yarra? So tell us, you know, a couple of the stepping stones. Obviously, now you're over in Western Australia. Where, how did you get from downtown Ringwood at Yarra Valley Grammar to be somewhere over in Western Australia leading uh, such a high-profile organisation? So I finished yeah, year 12, uh, class of 02. So uh, from, from 2003, I went to university, so did a... Uh, bachelor's course, an undergraduate degree, a Bachelor of Business Sports Management. So certainly um, had the had the passion and, and the, the flame was ignited in terms of wanting to pursue a, a career in sports administration or sports management. That was a three-year course and um, learned a few tricks, particularly late in the uh, late in the course when it really specialised and we we're starting to look at sports policy and sports governance law. Um, commercialization of sport that was that was really great uh, from there I got my first role which was effectively a, a graduate role at a um, it was a, a national charity and it's a there's a program called good sports whereby we worked with sporting clubs community level sporting clubs nationwide and there's about 6,000 clubs I believe currently in that good sports program and that's around good governance um, delivering uh, a safe healthy family friendly sporting club model um, so that that was terrific and I worked there for, for many years, about seven years in the end, and was able to fly all around the country and meet with govern governments and funding partners and um, uh, a range of, and diverse range of stakeholders, which gave me a really good grounding uh, and great exposure to, I guess, the industry and but what is, you know, corporate and professional life from a pretty young age. From there in around 2012, I, um, I left and, and started at the Essendon Football Club and uh, started there as, as community manager and then was promoted to a role called Head of Community, which was running Essendon's um, complete uh, community development, corporate social responsibility, government relations type um, department or, or, um, or portfolio. That was, yeah, just a marvellous role and, and probably really almost career building in a way in terms of it set some foundations of having exposure to the AFL industry um, and professional level sport and, um, and Essendon clearly being a, a very uh, high profile and, um, you know, successful football club. Um, and and that, was, that was great. I was able to, again, travel around the, the country, um, spend a lot of time in the Tiwi Islands uh, with Essendon funding the Tiwi Bombers football team. So built some relationships there, which have, uh, have flowed through to this day um, to me here at South Fremantle um, and had five staff uh, under my uh, direction at Essendon, um, which was really, really good. 
um, but left Essendon in 2015 um, to move over to Perth. Uh, my wife is West Australian and and uh, it was time to head to the other side of the country to, to spend some time with her family um, and to see how they do it in the West, I guess, as a, as a Victorian coming over and eyes wide open and... Um, yeah, just try and try and learn some um, learn some craft over here. So uh, I was unemployed for about six months um, whilst I was just getting settled and 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 learning about the environment here and what opportunities there may be. And I um, was fortunate to pick up a, a CEO job for a for a large basketball club here called Joondalup Wolves, and it was a really uh, interesting time in there um, in their uh, operation because we. Uh, went and built a, a $14 million new basketball stadium uh, at HBF Arena, north of Perth. And we were able to, to really work with that club to, to grow brand. And I think we doubled the membership with basketball absolutely booming, um, sort of a bit of a renaissance of the game and, and junior partici- um, participation sorry, in basketball in Western Australia has just completely um, blossomed. Um, so that was a really great period and probably um, helped to to build some um, some experience and, and get some runs on the board within the, the WA sporting landscape. Um, and, and following that, as I referenced in November 2019, uh, I moved here to, to be CEO of South Fremantle Football Club and back into football and, and um, you know, working hard with a great team and a terrific culture here to see uh, if we can if we can generate some real success and, and growth and sustainability for this iconic footy club in the West Australian market. What a fantastic journey, and uh, dotted with uh, moments of success and 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 moments of challenge, and uh, and the opportunity to keep stepping forward, which I love. But I'm interested to know whether or what you would identify is different about what the life that you are living now compared with maybe what you might have thought of or dreamed of when you were a young lad at Yarra Valley Grammar. How is it different? Yeah, it's a very, uh, very thought-provoking question. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily different, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, in, in many respects, um, it, it's possibly better. Um, and, and when I say better, I um, often have to pinch myself of the, the fortune, um, you know, and certainly a, a good pinch of luck. And I think that everyone would recognise timing and luck in careers does play a role, uh, might not be the primary role, but certainly a secondary role. Um, but but I feel you know really quite privileged and, and proud to have uh, embarked on the the career I have to, to this point. Um, I'm certainly not spending a huge amount of time reflecting because I am only 35 years old, and there's time for that in the the decade or two to come. But to um, to have to have had some some roles um, with some real seniority and and responsibility. Uh, to me is just you know a great privilege and and I do feel a, a strong sense of responsibility and and custodianship of um, you know for instance running this football club um, however um, I you know I want to really embrace that and and ensure that we can be successful and and use what skills and expertise I've learned on the way through and will continue to learn uh, to ensure that you know I can be seen as a as, as a high performing, you know, reliable, but, um, but, you know, team first leader that, that wants to make everyone around them, them far better. Um, if we think about, you know, again, a football adage, everyone playing their role, we talk about here that everyone has a role to play and, and, um, you know, it's not about who kicks the goals, uh, in a team environment. I'm talking off field, our admin team, because the scoreboard's everyone's and we all own the score and that's all that matters. And, and that's something that's really driving us here. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'll continue to, to use my career ongoing. Fantastic. I, I love that analogy. And, and it's so true. It, it takes everybody to be playing their role. And, and I really appreciate that. Um, we are getting very close to uh, needing to uh, wrap up our conversation. I've got a couple of quick fire questions that would ostensibly be um, maybe a one word answer, if you will. Sure. Not a problem. When you were at Yarra Valley Grammar, what house were you in, Cameron Britt? Plumber. Were, they, were Plumber any good back in the day? We were starting to get pretty sharp towards the end. I think we were we were um, easy beats when I first arrived, but we had a very strong swimming 
faction. Um, and then, yeah, towards the end, our athletics was was becoming a lot more successful. So I'd like to think it was far better than uh, when I left than when I started. Yeah, well, that, that's that's uh, you, you had an impact, perhaps. That's a good thing. Tell me what uh, what would what would you tend to find in your lunchbox when you're a schoolboy? Uh, definitely a piece of fruit. Uh, I was a little bit of a little bit of a devotee of a small bag of chips, and they often wouldn't make recess. Uh, they'd be gone, and yeah, generally a sandwich. And I was a I was a pretty pretty up and down guy. Maybe some Vegemite and cheese. If you had a choice between entering the hundred meter sprint or the hundred meter freestyle, what would you choose? Sprint, and I'd happily run it backwards rather than swim. <laughs> Very good. Hey, tell me, what do you miss about Yarra Valley Grammar? It's funny, you know, and um, it's probably the same answer to what I'm missing right now and um, definitely a bit of connection with my with my mates. Um, you know, moving over to WA, things like, you know, WhatsApps and, and Zooms and, and just fo- FaceTime, you know, phone calls, they're all super, super handy. But, you know, being able to, to go and catch up for a beer or, or go out for dinner. Um, I, I'm definitely missing that, and and that's probably one of the the uh, you know the the downfalls uh, of of moving to the other side of the country amongst all the upside that I've mentioned previously. Yeah, that's a, a good answer. I appreciate that. And my final question is: given that this is a podcast uh, based on school and Yarra old grammarians being inspired by Yarra. What's something that you've learned recently? Um, I think I've learned, uh, and will certainly not uh, attempt to, to be too political with this response, but I think I've learned, and, and I think probably many people have learned that have their eyes open right now, just how fragile our society still is and how much work there is still to come to, to make us all connected and feeling like our, our place and part in the world is uh is fair equitable and appreciated and um yeah as i said uh, not not trying to take any sides but um I, I looked with astonishment and disappointment that um you know our society how far has it really come mm. yes there's uh, lots of reflecting and observation and pondering that i think still needs to happen um, with world events and even those closer to home Cameron, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for your generosity in in what is about to be a really busy day for you. Thanks for sharing your reflections, your observations, your learnings, your stumblings and your growth along the way. This is Inspired by Yarra and we salute you for being inspired by Yarra but also continuing to be an inspiration to Yarra. Cameron Britt from the class of 2002, thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. And an interesting note to conclude that conversation. You know, we've explored sporting triumphs and challenges and his role as a leader and Cameron's move from one state to another and establishing himself and going on and building a a reputation in his chosen career. But then also to come to the reality of our seemingly small place in a much bigger organisation and that is our earth and the interactions and conversations and pressures that our existence, our experience is having right now on a global scale. There are so many challenges, so many interesting and difficult and also opportunities for growth that are happening in leadership, in government, in health, in finance not only across our nation, but across the world. And it fascinates me as I have the privilege of speaking with Yarra Old Grammarians, knowing them as young people, you know, knocking about at school, and then the growth and the development and the maturity as they experience life. It's a beautiful thing to witness, and many of you too have been on that journey of growth and maturity as you've experienced life both as a student here at Yarra and now leading families and leading organizations and leading community groups and businesses and understand that it's sort of part of the human experience but 
it's one that is good to reflect on from time to time. So thank you. Thank you for being part of this community, a community where we do like to tell stories and share experiences and learn from one another. My name is Paul Joy and on behalf of everyone here at Yarra, I want to wish you another day of inspiration where you get out there and you make a positive impact in the world around you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.